Hello, all you gardeners, and happy Tuesday, May 18th. Welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm your host, Lucretia Shanfarber. And that lovely theme music we're listening to is Willow, the all-woman band from Quadra Island, performing C minor. You know, I suggest you go to their Facebook page, check out Willow Music Band, and listen to more of their folk roots music. Well, brr, it's a chilly day here on Cortez Island. You know, when it comes to the weather, we gardeners have to be philosophical and stoic and prepared. I always think of this silly little ditty I learned as a child when it comes to predicting the weather. It it goes something like this. Whether it's cold or whether it's hot, we're going to have weather, whether or not. Whether we like the weather we've got, we're going to have weather, whether or not. See, I told you it was silly, but I just love it because it tells us that things are changeable. And we've certainly noticed a change in the weather here on Cortez Island and Quadra Island the last few days. We've gone from very warm and dry to a little bit wet and even chilly. But if there's one thing gardeners know, it's that weather conditions are super changeable, especially in the face of climate change. So what can we be planting right about now in the middle of May? Connie Kirimoto from Gardens on the Go in Qualicum Beach is going to gab about what she's planting and how climate change changes the way she gardens. We will also have Jane Newman, the amazingly energetic Managing Director of Cortez Island Museum and Archive Society, gabbing about the newest museum exhibit, Listening to Bees. That's starting this coming Thursday. We will also have Melissa Rickey, our Bokashi Compost Queen. She'll be with us to gab about a very exciting new compost project on Cortez Island. And first up, we have Jennifer Banks Dahl joining us from her busy kitchen at Foot Forward Forest Garden. There, I can do it, Jen. She's <laughs> with us right now, and she's going to gab about how wonderful rhubarb really is. Thanks so much for joining us, Jen. Thanks for having me, Lou. And I guess our farm name is quite the tongue twister. Maybe we need to uh, think about that. Well, maybe it's just me. You say it. <laughs> let me sure let me hear not. you say it. <laughs> Foot forward forest garden, all those F's in a row. But what a beautiful place it is. And I understand you have some amazing rhubarb growing this year. Yeah. So last time I was on, you had asked what I had growing right now. And I, I said rhubarb because, oh my gosh, that is our favorite thing about spring, especially my girls. They just love rhubarb and they're always asking me, when can we pick rhubarb? And, you know, it's the first fruit of the spring, although actually it's a a vegetable. We could call it maybe a dessert vegetable. (laughs) But if you plant it in your garden, it will just come up every year, and you don't have to be worried about planting it every year as long as you give it some good manure or compost in the spring and the fall and some water, you're going to have a great crop of rhubarb every year. So when we bought this farm on Quadra, there was no garden. It was all uh, grass, but there was a rhubarb plant. And I think a lot of people find that when they buy an old property, that there's already rhubarb growing there. Mm. So that was the case with our farm. Right. And we, but there we was didn't. only one rhubarb plant, and that was just not enough we didn't Since have then. rhubarb when we started our garden oh. on Quadra, but we brought some from our garden in Vancouver, and we now have about eight huge patches of, of rhubarb, all started from that that one little crown. So I agree with you. It's easy to grow. It grows quickly. And I love you calling it a dessert vegetable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and it's easy to, to propagate. You just divide it before it starts growing in the spring and then replant those little pieces. You have to wait to harvest them, though, for about a year or two years to make sure the plant is strong before you start 
harvesting mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So you add a lot of manure and compost to really get it well established? Yeah, that's right. And you need to water it as well. And you know, I once thought that rhubarb was a plant you couldn't kill, but I've since learned that's not true. Oh. But uh, our friends in Alberta, they buried their rhubarb plant under about like eight feet of topsoil when they were doing some landscaping. And the first year, no rhubarb. But the second year, that rhubarb plant came back with a vengeance, and it was like the biggest rhubarb plant they'd ever seen. Oh, that's a great story. No wonder the people in the prairies love it so much. You know, I harvest most of our rhubarb and take it over to Doug at Good Libations here on Cortez Island so he can make his amazing rhubarb champagne. I think I've given you a bottle of that. Yes, yes. I will always take a bottle if you ever want to give me a gift. Okay, (laughs) okay. Well, I I, I think you deserve one for today, that's for sure. And and sometimes I do make rhubarb ice cream or muffins. My daughter-in-law, Sue, makes rhubarb marmalade. What are you making with your rhubarb this year? Well, you know, the list is very long. I was was just thinking about that uh, this morning before we chatted, and... um, I mean, traditionally, rhubarb was also called pie plant because people used it for pie because it's just so fantastic. So it's a great, a great thing to make desserts out of. My mom used to make this rhubarb syrup that she would put with ginger ale and make a rhubarb punch, she called it. And that was like a very special thing growing up. And a really easy thing to make. And it also makes really beautiful pink ice cube that you can put in, you know, club soda or in your G&T for added color and flavor and added vitamins as well. Oh, I like the idea of of a pink syrup. And that's a concentrate, like a cordial. Last time you were on, you were talking about your elderberry flower cordial. So it sounds like it's something along those same lines. It's very similar. You cook the rhubarb just with water, and then you basically strain it through cheesecloth, and you can save the pulp to put in pancakes or to make, you know, rhubarb sauce with. And then you combine that syrup with sugar. And they say in order to figure out how much sugar for that syrup, you want to weigh your liquid rhubarb and then add half that weight in sugar. And then you could add lemon or orange. You know, my mom adds some cloves as well to give it extra flavor. But that's basically how you make that syrup. And it's super handy and and really pretty. What else are you making with rhubarb this year? So one thing that we discovered last year is called rhubarb sauce. So it's a barbecue sauce made with rhubarb. And I actually found it when I was Googling plum barbecue sauce because we have so many plums. But I actually like the rhubarb barbecue sauce the best. And, you know, in the summer, we have a wiener roast every Friday night. And my favorite thing now to put on my my wieners or my smokies is the rhubarb sauce and homemade mayonnaise. It is just to die for. So if we have time, I could tell you how to make the rhubarb sauce. Oh, yeah, we have time. Let's let's hear it. I mean, how could we pass up on an offer like that? Let's hear that I recipe. I know. It's, it's just so delicious. And this recipe actually comes from a blogger who's, who lives in Courtney, and her, her blog is House and Homestead, so I'll give credit to her. So this is her recipe. So you need about eight cups of chopped rhubarb, And you could use red rhubarb or you could use green rhubarb for this recipe because the color isn't doesn't really matter because it turns brown in the end anyway. So eight cups of chopped rhubarb, three and a half cups of brown sugar, one and a half cups of chopped raisins, half a cup of chopped onion, half a cup of apple cider vinegar, or white vinegar, and then some spices and salt. So you need about one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of cinnamon, one teaspoon of ginger, and one teaspoon of allspice. 
So you take all of those ingredients and put them on in your stainless steel pot and you bring them to a boil. And of course the rhubarb releases all kinds of juices when you do that. And then you reduce it and you cook it till it's thick, which takes about 30 minutes. And then you can decide if you want it to be a chunky barbecue sauce or a smooth barbecue sauce. And if you want it to be smooth, then you just blend it with your immersion blender. And how do you preserve it, Jen? What's that? How are you preserving it? So then if you want to preserve it, well, you can put it in the fridge if you think you're going to eat it quickly. But what we do is we water bath can it. So what you would do is you put it into either half pint or pint jars that are, you know, of course, all sterilized. And then you put it in your water bath canner for 15 minutes. And then Anna recommends that you, when you turn off your canner, you leave it in your in the hot water for another five minutes before you take them out of your water bath canner. And that recipe is for canning pint jars, but you could can for the same amount of time if you were just doing the half. I'll bet that is a popular little item. <laughs> are you giving? Yes. I, I, I imagine that people are um, hoping to get some for Christmas gifts and things of that uh, <laughs> of, of that sort. Well, Mark is recommending that I make some to sell. So, <laughs> if you join our Facebook page on uh, the Foot Forward Forest Farm Facebook page, we'll put an ad up if I decide to. Uh, sell some of that and I'll put the recipe there. Wonderful. We will watch for that. Maybe you'll post that recipe on our Gabbing About Gardening Facebook page too. And of course, people can hear it again when they go to the podcast of today's show on CortezRadio.ca. So thank you so much for that, Jen. It just sounds yummy. And I'm really looking forward to Talking with you again soon, hearing another recipe, hearing how Foot Forward Forest Garden is going. There, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Will you join us again in a couple of weeks, Jen? Yes, I'd love to. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Bye bye, Jen. Me. That's Jennifer Banks Dahl from her beautiful 40 acre Foot Forest Garden. She is on Quadra Island and she's telling us how to make rhubarb barbecue sauce. I'm definitely going to check that out. When I was a curly-headed baby My daddy sat me down upon his knee Said, son, you go to school and learn your letters Don't you be no dusty minor boy like me Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars roared and a rumble past my door Now they stand in a row all rust and empty And the yelling and end don't stop here anymore I used to think my daddy was a black man Had scrip enough to buy the company store Now he goes to town with empty pockets and his face is white as a February snow Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars roaring and a rumble past my door Now they stand in a row of rust and empty And the l and don't stop here anymore I never thought I'd learn to love the cold Never thought I'd love to hear those tipples roar But God, if only grass could turn to money Them greenbacks fill my pockets once more Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler Cold cars roaring and a rumble past my door Now they stand and roll, rust and empty and the yellow and end don't stop here anymore.
trees and grass will grow in through the floor. And there were trees and grass will grow in through the floor. Well, I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler. Cold cars roared and a rumble past my door. Now they stand in a row all rust and empty. And the other end don't stop here anymore. I was born and raised at the mouth of the hazard holler. Cold cars roared and a rumble past my door. Now they stand and roll, rust and empty. And the yelling end don't stop here anymore. No, the yelling end don't stop here anymore. Welcome back to Gabbing About Gardening. Our wonderful Melissa Ricky is available to gab with us about Bakashi compost. I think of Melissa as the Bakashi compost queen. And you have some exciting news to tell us about, Melissa. I've, I've held back telling people too much about it. I wanted you to be the one to tell everybody. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Nice Thank to have you. you back. Thank you. So yeah. what's the big news? Oh, the big news is I've been uh, very fortunate to receive a couple of grants for a really exciting project. So I just wanted to start out by thanking the uh, Cortez Micro Grants for Neighbors and the Campbell River Community Foundation for a neighborhood grant that they gave us. And, and we got some of the money from the Cortez Micro Grants to build a... Bokashi and Vermicomposting Demonstration Center at Linnea Farm. That's fabulous news. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I mean, money is great. I know you're doing a lot of work without that kind of support, but how fabulous to have it. So t- tell me what your plan is. Okay, so it's going to be set up in one of the sheds adjacent to the ramp that goes in for the public library at Linnea. Aha. Uh-huh. And we're going to have Bokashi composting set up, which is going to be actively processing the kitchen waste that comes from the Linnea Education Center. So from the Food Security Guild activities in the kitchen there, and also the kitchen waste that's produced by the soil apprentices that are living on the farm. So we'll be bokashiing that and in a very visual way, have things out and labeled in signs to explain the process so that someone could just drop by and look at it and learn. We're also going to have three different examples of vermicomposting from basic and small and homemade and easy and inexpensive to make all the way to a, uh, we've got a hungry bin that's just arrived from Richmond, BC. But these hungry bins are um, really skookum setups that are the higher tech version. They were designed in New Zealand. Just a great thing for someone to have at home. If, they, if they're not into putting together something with buckets or Rubbermaid totes, this is a bit of a higher tech version. Yeah, so three different uh, options for worm composting. So it'll be a space where someone could come and stand in front of it and see what's going on and learn by reading signs and different information materials that we have there. And it's also going to be a site for public workshops. Wow. A lot um, of education going on. So you've got public workshops, you have a demonstration of three different kinds of vermiculture, worm composting, and you have the Bakashi system going on. Yeah. Oh, this must be a compost junkie's dream, Melissa. <laughs> I know you must be just thrilled. I am. I'm super thrilled. A big shout out to Tamara at Linnea Farm for her yes attitude about this project. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm putting a call out for any youth who would like to be involved because I'm hoping to recruit a couple of youth to help learn about the system and teach about the system and keep it running. And how are you going to structure this? Is it going to be open certain days? How are you going to proceed with this big project? Well, it's going to be open all the time for folks to come by and look at. It's not going to be like a hands-on thing for everyone until a workshop was happening. So visually, it's going to be there all the time, open. 
it's, to it's, look at. It's just an amazing opportunity. Let's just back up a wee bit and and talk about what's involved in actually setting up the vermiculture system. Explain how it works. Well, once the bin is constructed with the proper ventilation, I start my worms on a bedding of aged cow manure and then uh, put the worms in and start feeding them. It's that simple, is it? <laughs> it's it's fairly simple. It's it's about getting the having the moisture be correct and the ventilation be correct and the amount of food going in being the right amount for the number of worms. So it's it's just about feeling that out and letting the worms get comfortable and established in in the different spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday on the Gabbing About Gardening Zoom gathering for gardeners, we had Aaron Stevens showing us his organic gardens in Vancouver, and he really focused on his worm farm, and he was laughing, saying that his little granddaughters love nothing more than to open up the lid and, and play with the worms, handle the worms. Whereas I remember there was always that, ooh, a worm thing when I was a kid, but things have really changed. I think so, yeah. I think we're starting to see worms as the wonderful creatures that they are. Well, they sure make a big difference in the garden. And the Bakashi compost, I really didn't know very much about Bakashi until you started to come on the show. Can you just tell us a little bit about Bakashi again and, and how you're going to set that up? So Bakashi is a way of fermenting kitchen waste using an inoculated substrate, most commonly bran, that's been inoculated with a solution that sometimes is called effective microorganisms. I call it mother culture. It's essentially lactic acid bacteria, or lactobacillus, and a few other bacteria. So kitchen waste, it's an anaerobic process whereby kitchen waste is layered with this brand inoculant and then lidded in a lidded five-gallon pail and left for two weeks to ferment. And what it does is it breaks, it's, it's not compost when it's finished. It's, it's fermented kitchen waste, which I found that the worms move into it much more quickly and go through it much more quickly than if I just put regular kitchen waste in my worm bin. They just, they absolutely love it because the breakdown process has already begun. Some folks also put their finished bokashi in trenches and just kind of bury it, and it the worms move in that way, and it turns to soil really quickly and also adds beautiful probiotics to your soil because it, the lactobacillus is, is in there. And, yeah, it's just a really healthy thing to add to your living soil picture to affect the soil in a way that allows your plants to absorb more of what's already in your soil. Well, I'm thrilled that young people are going to be getting involved in this. This this must really be a dream come true for you. Yeah, this is great. And where is it going to be on the farm? So it's going to be in one of the sheds that's just beside the ramp to the public library there, not far from the parking lot, right by the Ed Center there. Really front and center. That's excellent. I'm going to be coming by. When did you say it's going to be set up again? Well, I'll be gathering the materials over the next couple of weeks. I'd say within the month it'll be set up. So any interested youth who would like to work with me on this can give me a call at 6648 and we can talk about that volunteer opportunity. Oh, wonderful. Okay, you heard it, all of you youths. It's time to call Melissa Ricky, and you're going to have a wonderful opportunity to learn about worm composting, vermiculture composting, and bakashi composting from the compost queen herself, Melissa <laughs> Ricky. Thanks so much for telling us about it, Melissa. Okay. And we'll be in touch in a couple of weeks. We want to hear how things are moving forward with this fabulous project. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. We were talking with Melissa Ricky. She's setting up a wonderful demonstration compost center with three vermiculture bins and a bakashi compost bin at Linnea Farm. And that's going to be a wonderful thing for young people especially, but anybody who's interested in learning more about compost. We really appreciate Linnea Farm doing that. 
up next is Connie Kiramoto. Connie is a horticulturist and a horticulture educator at Gardens on the Go, her business in Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. She's a great garden teacher, and we've reached her to help us decide what we should be doing in our gardens right about now, considering this cooler weather, at least for now. Hi, Connie, and welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. Hi there. You know, I'm just itching to know, this is going to sound perhaps like a mundane question, but is it warm enough to plant our beans yet? Well, I planted beans and they're up. It depends on the kind of bean that you're growing, because there are some that germinate in colder soils. So the purple royalty beans and the purple peacock beans and the scarlet runner beans will germinate in cooler soils than the green beans and the yellow beans. The yellow beans are like at the hottest of all. Okay, so go for the purple royalty, the peacock, and the scarlet runners. Because I've not even put mine in yet. I just, you know, one day it's so warm and I think, okay, I'm doing it tomorrow. And then that day it's so cold and I'll put my finger in the soil. And, and don't they say the soil should be at about 10 degrees? Yeah, they really do. And it seems like, I don't know, I managed to get them started. So I'm just happy. I did cover mine with a little bit of Rime. You know, maybe that kind of speeded them along just a little bit. And they did germinate during those really warm days. Here in Qualicum, my backyard in some cases was in the high 20s last week. So that's I planted them just before the new moon. Aha. Now, and, do you uh, follow the moon planting to a degree? I do whenever I can. I find it helps me to kind of stay organized, like to make sure I don't neglect anything. Like I try to do the planets and the moon. So if the moon is going from new moon to full moon, I do above ground crops. And if the moon is going from full to new, I do below ground crops and beans and peas. Yeah, that's about how I'm doing it too. I, I find you can get really into the technical side of it or just, you know, keep it really simple. But I, I like the way that it allows me a little bit of a break. I don't feel so harried about planting all the time. You know, it gives me time to just weed for a few days in a row and, and take my time. Yeah, I really like it because it kind of reminds me to stay on task a bit. Sometimes I'll procrastinate, especially if I have a lot of work you know, side work as well, like teaching and pruning and stuff that I'm doing for other people. And then, but if I, you know, kind of stay on top of the moon calendar, then I'll go, okay, well, it's the last day to plant my root crops for two weeks, so I better do it today. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know. I really like that about it, too. Well, we're going to have to have another gabbing session just about moon planting. Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on, on climate change and how it's changing the way you're gardening. Is it is it making a change in how you're approaching things, Connie? Yeah, I really see a big difference in a lot of things just in my garden, just since I've been here. So I've been here for maybe about 12 years. And it seemed like the first years I was here, I've really focused on building up my soil because I found that I was really watering a lot. And now, like in April, we had about a third of the rain that we normally have, and yet my garden was pretty resilient. Like I, if this had happened a few years ago before I built up the soil, I definitely would have had to water like crazy. And yet, you know, I do find that after building up the soil, lots of organic matter, it, it is holding the water better, which is wonderful because water is a valuable resource as well. I also find that, you know, the temperature fluctuations are really quite extreme, like this spring was more extreme than usual where my backyard, it would be, you know, in the high 20s 
during the day and then drop to a few degrees below freezing at night. So so that's really hard on plants too. So I had to do things to kind of mitigate that so that things didn't come out of dormancy. I use lots of mulch that it insulates the soil some so it doesn't heat up too much, which sounds almost counterintuitive because, you know, heating up means things that are moving ahead. But when the temperature drops that much at night, what can happen to a plant is during the day it can come out of dormancy and suck up all kinds of water into its tissues. And then if it drops below freezing at night, that water will just freeze and burst the cells and you really have to watch that, and mulch really helps to insulate the be between either the too hot and the too cold, so it keeps plants kind of on a more even keel, which is really important with them because things like cauliflower and broccoli can bolt prematurely if the temperatures are fluctuating too greatly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm having a few things bolting right now, um, the, the mustard in the garden, but I think I planted it too closely. Say, Could you talk to us a little bit about hardening off? You're talking about these extremes in temperature. One day it's really warm, next day it's really cold. And, you know, some of us want to get our tomatoes out into the garden, but you're never really sure how to approach that situation. Can you explain what hardening off is and how important that is when we are moving things from indoors to into the garden? You know, one of the biggest mistakes that I've made in the past, and I see other people making sometimes because they haven't learned the hard way yet, like I did. (laughs) What happens with plants if they're grown under low light levels is what we think of as a low light level, we might think that our plants are getting adequate light inside, especially if you're growing them under lights and stuff, but it's not quite the same as growing them outside. Outside, they're getting light, they're getting more light intensity, they're getting light from all different sides. They can also be exposed to drying winds. And so we're always tempted if, oh, it's a really nice day outside and really sunny, that we're going to take our plants from inside and put them out for them to enjoy some direct sunshine. Unfortunately, what happens is that there's a mechanism on the plant called the thalcloid membrane that opens up to receive light. When it's grown under artificial light or when a plant is grown in a windowsill that doesn't get a high light intensity from all different angles, is that that thalcloid membrane opens way, way up on the plant's leaf. And it opens faster than it closes. And so what happens is that thalcloid membrane actually protects a plant from excess light. But if it's wide open, it can't do that. So you've got the plant inside. Thalcloid membrane is wide open. You move it outside. It can't close quickly enough to protect plants from the bright, intense light. And so they get, like, quite scorched look on them, and quite often the leaves will die. So that's hardening off for even light. So it's actually better to put your plants out on a mild, kind of misty, rainy day to get them used to the light, as well as a little bit of air movement and a little bit cooler temperatures. So gradually move them out a couple hours a day and then bring them in or when I don't have time to increase the hours little bit by little bit when I do plant them out I always plant in the evening for one so that it has a whole night to get adjusted and then the morning sun is very much more gentle on it and then quite often I'll cover my plants for a portion of the day as well to protect them from either the wind or the temperature extremes or the intense sun at noon. So it kind of gives the plant a little bit of an adjustment period, both for light, for heat, and for air movement. Because if you haven't had a fan going, moving the stems, the stems can be a little bit weak as well. Mm -hmm. So those are three factors that you have to harden off for, all three of them. 
And just by introducing it gradually and when the sun is sort of a little gentler rather than full, like I don't know what you've got there, but I've kind of got sun on and off here today. So today would be actually kind of a nice day to harden yeah. plants off. Yeah, it would be a great day for that. Canada. First of all, it's just a fabulous description of hardening off. Thank you for that, Connie. So what t- transplants are you putting in and what tips do you have for us for the actual transplanting part of things? I'm taking a bit of a chance this year. I mean, what gardener doesn't? So I started some pumpkins in an unheated greenhouse, and I've put my pumpkins out. And I put my zucchini out. I didn't want to quite put my tomatoes out because I'm worried about the rain that's forecasted for this week. Like, it's a little early for the tomatoes to get watered overhead, I'm feeling. So, I mean, I usually grow my tomatoes outside, but I do like to wait until the weather is stabilized. And, you know, tomatoes can really stand being really pot-bound, you know, as long as they have enough nutrition in that pot. And as long as you keep them somewhat watered, they're okay. But I knew that my pumpkins and my squash were going to, they they don't really like transplanting as much as other things. So I don't like to get them Mm pot-bound. So when I transplanted my squash, what I've been doing is I've been digging out my endless buttercups and putting them into huge piles around where I'm planning to plant my squash. And so I had these uh, four big mounds of buttercups right in the middle of my garden. And then I covered them with newspaper, like really six, ten sheets of newspaper. And then I covered that with some oat straw. And I made a little well in the top. And that's where I planted my squash plant. Now, the decomposing, when I stuck my hand, like I've been piling up the buttercups for weeks now, and then when I stuck my hand in them, they were composting. And so what it's providing for those pumpkins and squash plants is that little bit of heat from the decomposition of the buttercups. And I threw some duck manure in there, of course, as well. So there's that little bit of heat from the decomposition that I'm hoping will keep my pumpkins warm. And then I covered them. (laughs) I've discovered a really cheap way to make loches. I had all these freezer baskets that I never use because I'm not organized enough to use them anyway in the freezer. Uh And so I covered them with Rime, and now I'm dropping them over my plants. Wow. Connie, you're an experimenter. You're amazing. I'm really looking forward to hearing how that pile of buttercups goes. I think a lot of us, our ears perked up as soon as you talked about a compost pile of buttercups that you're planting your pumpkins and your squash in. Will you come back in a couple weeks and give us an update on how all that's going? Sure, yeah. Connie, thank you so much for being with us. With us. It's just been delightful. I've learned so much, and we will get back together very soon. Great. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Me too, Connie. Have a wonderful day in the garden. That's Connie Kiramoto from Gardens on the Go. You can visit her Facebook page for more of her amazing gardening tips. Coming up next, we are going to talk with Jane Newman from the Cortez Island Museum. She's the managing director. She's going to tell us about the new museum exhibit, Listening to Bees. Stay with us. I'm Lucretia. You're listening to Gabbing About Gardening on Cortez Radio, CKTZ 89.5 FM. You know the story, once upon a time There was a boy and a girl and some wicked rhymes I guess the stars were aligned, don't you know It's all about time, thing She was a real cutie, with red apple cheeks He was a wolf in swan's clothing She's a mystery, I said this gal's for me Just wait and see One day he rode right up And walked on right through the door He pulled over a chair and stroked her long hair While she just lay there He said, hey, how's it going? I know that you don't know me just well I like the beaches, long walks I like candlelit talks Hey, I think I hear wedding bells So 
sometime at midnight Or maybe later He whispers in her ear I think I love you dear The sky's falling Whoa. The sky is falling in love Falling in love He was in a little closer Well take advantage, no sir I've only done this once or twice And you seem pretty nice The sky is falling The sky is falling in love Falling in love But you seem a little under the weather Troubles will be light as a feather I hear in a bit of a bind I'm the right kind of guy you find Oh, I'll pick up this chair I'll find lions and bears To show you just how much I care Sometime at midnight Or maybe later He whispers in her ear I think I love, love you too The sky's falling Whoa. The sky is falling in love Falling in love Has anyone ever told you Hello and welcome back to Gabbing About Gardening That's some peppy, beautiful music from Willow, the all-woman band from Quadra Island. And we have beautiful peppy Jay Newman with us. I really want to hear about this new exhibit that opens this Thursday, May 20th. Tell us all about it. Well, Listen to Bees was, um, I guess, the, the very beginning, the, the very start I'd heard about it was Nancy Kendall, the vice president of the uh, Cortez Island Museum and Archives Society, a couple of years ago, actually sort of put a bee in my bonnet and said she really wanted to do an exhi- uh, a full exhibit or like a small space, something in the main gallery room uh, about bees. And, you know, we sort of thought about it and it sort of stayed in our bonnet buzzing around for the last couple of years. And then early in 2021, we knew that we were ready to jump into it, and um, one of the exhibits was coming out of the space in the main gallery, and we were ready to go. So it's called Listening to Bees. And it took a few years, but it's been well worth it. I'm sure Nancy is is thrilled. When you think about an exhibit of bees, it, it leads to all kinds of possibilities. How are you approaching it? Well, what we looked at really was, I wanted to look at the issues sort of uh, of bees worldwide, but also locally on Cortez. So we really wanted to look picture and small island picture. And we learned an awful lot about bees through this process. And what we focused on were really native bees. So four categories of the native bees. We focused on honey bees. We focused on why are bees dying and what you can do as a person living on Cortez or someone coming into the exhibit, you know, wanting to learn about what they can do. So we've got uh, specific uh, areas within the exhibit that really are under these key themes. And then we really wanted to t- another level of looking way, way back at the mythological aspects of bees and, and some of the lore that has been told, stories told, and some of the sayings that have come out of the human association with bees over many years. So uh, really, we started by, first of all, connecting with all the beekeepers on Cortez Island. Mm -hmm. Good idea. What did you learn from them? Wow. Are they a fount of knowledge and information? And there aren't that many beekeepers on Cortez, but those that are here... Several of them have been doing it for many years. I would say about four of them specifically doing it for many years. One of them, Reinhold, he's from um, Refuge Cove on Redonda, and he has been learning about bees since he was a young boy. And he came over to Canada at some point, and he took up his own beekeeping practices. And so he just has had so much experience and exposure to all the aspects of beekeeping. And another one that was a really, really wealth of, a solid wealth of information was Tony Clark here on Cortez. And so, as they say, we met with all these beekeepers and had discussions with them and went to the apiaries and really learned how honeybees on Cortez are doing. And it's, it's variable. It's really variable how they're doing. Is it? What have you found in creating this exhibit, Jane? What can gardeners do to help the bees? They are struggling. Well, I think really the the key thing is is sort of creating habitat and having bee-friendly gardens uh, and not using pesticides but using natural pest control methods 
And um, really, I think it, it really is a lot about, uh, the, it's on our walls here. If anybody wants to come in and see the exhibit, there is a really very well-defined area that talks specifically about what you as a person on the planet anywhere can do. And there's there's quite a few things. You can leave your yards more wild. You can, you know, in the fall and in the spring, leave your stems and stalks and fallen branches and things like that down on the ground. And, you know, it's, it's suggestion is always keep a bit of a messier yard. And yet that's completely the opposite of what we're always taught as as we garden, right? Or as we grow up gardening. It's always about clean up, clean up as early as possible. It's it's such an incredible shift in how we approach things. Well, and it's also like your whole uh, movement that you've been really a proponent of is no-dig gardening. Uh, we weren't taught to not dig to get our gardens to grow well. We, I mean, I wasn't anyway, and I think that's the similar thing for, as you say, we were into grooming and making sure that things were tidy and organized and, and well kept. And really contrary to that is what the bees need. And wild bees are prolific, you know, in certain areas of the, of, of our gardens and our properties already. But a lot of them live in the ground and they live in little holes in wood and they live in, you know, the various spots that we may be surprised that it's actually bees making those holes in the garden, like minor bees, and the small boxes that may have small holes in the woods, you know, that might be the the, the mason bee or a leaf cutter bee that's living in those. And so our native bee section in the exhibit really talks to how you can, you know, the behavior of some of these bees so you can start to recognize them. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for telling us about it, Jane. It's it's a really important and fascinating topic. Listening to Bees, it opens this Thursday at the Cortez Museum. This Thursday is also World Bee Day. Thanks, Jane. We'll gab soon, and I'd like to hear more about that exhibit again. Thanks a lot, Lucretia. It's great talking to you, and I love gabbing about gardening. I know. You do it so well. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Bye. Bye-bye now. That was Jane Newman, Managing Director of the Cortez Island Museum and Archive Society. To find out more about the Listening to Bees exhibit, just go to cortezmuseum.com. I have a dream. So that's our show for today, Gabbing About Gardening. We'll be back next Tuesday at 11.30. Herbalist and best-selling author Brigitte Mars from Boulder, Colorado, will gab about eating your weeds for good health. And she really means it. She's written recipe books, and she does it herself. She'll tell us what we should be eating that we're actually pulling out and throwing away. And Lonnie Taylor, just back from Haida Gwaii, is going to be gabbing about Haida Gwaii plants life and how magical that experience was for her. We'll also have Arzina Hamir. She'll be back to help us choose the best squash varieties as it finally warms up and we can plant squash. And award-winning science professor Dr. Lee Gass will gab about hummingbirds. He's studied them for 35 years and he tells great stories. That's next week on Gabbing About Gardening. And do check out our podcasts on cortezradio.ca. And hey, remember to join us on Facebook and Instagram. And every Monday on Zoom, we host the Gabbing About Gardening Zoom Gathering for Gardeners. Next Monday, we'll gab with Michael Abelman about his new book, Grow Good Grub. Michael is a chef, he's an organic farmer, a social activist, a celebrated storyteller, and a phenomenal photographer. He'll have stories to tell and pictures to show. You can get all the details on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today on Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lucretia Shanfarber. Huge thank you to our show and podcast producer, Brian McKinnon. This is Cortez Radio, CKTZ, 89.5 FM. And this, coming up, is the music of reggae legend, Pato Bantan. It's called New Day Dawning. Thanks for tuning in. 
Now get outside and get dirty. You may think this is hysterical. Yes, I believe in things my eyes have never seen. Oh, it's a new day dawning, and I can hear the angels calling. Oh, yes, it is a new day dawning. It's gotta be universal love. Oh, yes, there is a new. Listen the warning, new day is dawning A message from the bright and morning star To the people them near and far Follow me again, new day dawning And I can hear the angels calling Oh yes, this is a new day dawning It's gotta be universal love Universal love, come on, come on. 